Oh, there we go. Oh, oh my perfect. God. My lights are too time. bright. <laughs> Amen. Uh, How are you? Good. Wow, your hair looks beautiful. If you know how I was rained on today in Manhattan, I came home, I like blow dried just this part. So I'm glad I made the illusion. <laughs> my hair looks good. It always looks like you have perfectly blow dried hair. Oh my god, I get my hair done like twice a week. Oh, smart. Well, it looks like it. Good job. My little tub. I wash it like once a two weeks. Good. Good. It's like very healthy to cut it. It really is. Okay, I'm so excited to have you on. First of all, you are officially my Jewish life client, my first of many, um, which is very excited. Congratulations to the Shani Suisa agency. <laughs> this is going to be a, a very promising experience. Um, but I'm excited to have you on. I mean, you've been doing so much in the Jewish world these days, I think more so than any other time um, really in your career. So this is the perfect time to have you on. There's been so much going on. You've had like a hundred events recently. I'd love if you could just give our audience like a little bit about, uh, we'll get more into like what you do with sports and all that after, but just talk to us about like your Jewish background, like your history, where all this sort of like speaking stuff is coming from now, because there's such a, a pickup of that. You've really been a lot more outspoken about it and you're doing like 10 events a week. Yeah. I mean, the events have been like, just such a good way to bring communities together because they're not all necessarily Jewish events. So I love to see people actually engaging and trying to build these bridges because I feel like that's the most important part. Mm. But about myself is, you know, I had like, I would say a typical New York, I guess I could say that's safe, Jewish background. Like growing up, we were always pretty modern Orthodox, which might be a reach, meaning I always knew I was Jewish. I was always told I was Jewish. I was always I don't want to say proud yet. We're going to get there. Mm. I was complacent. I knew of it. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I didn't know otherwise. It was just, I'm Jewish. If you're not great, if you are great. Like, that was all. I always kept kosher. It was like, not oh, a you, you always kept kosher? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's awesome. I'd love to share this story how in pre-K, um, I, you know, I want to have chicken nuggets like the rest of the kids in school. And one day... Every single day, apparently, I would ask the lunch lady if the chicken nuggets were kosher. And one day, this was very mean, she fed up and she got fed up and she said, yes, they're kosher. And I ate them. And I came home and I was like, Ima, I had kosher chicken nuggets today at school. But she's like, they're not kosher, Emily. And the next day in school, I cried so much. They actually sent me to the nurse's office because I couldn't get over the fact that I had broken kosher. And I was in pre-K. I'm like four years old. Oh, my God. Wait, but that is like so messed up. It is messed up in retrospect now that I think about it, but it just shows the point how like, since I'm four, it's like, I didn't know anything different. Mm. So when people, gosh, this is so hard. How do you do this? It's like, I was born into it. So it's not that hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Also, I feel like with the modern Orthodox, like there's a sense almost of like this idea that your Judaism is so cultural that even if you're not keeping like, you know, the Shabbat or this, that, and the other, you're still going to like an Orthodox shul for the high holidays right. if you do go or like, you know what I mean? Like you still are doing like all of that kind of stuff. It's a very Sephardi thing. Are you, where is your family from? Um, Turkey, Bulgaria, Iraq, and then like a huge mix, Greek, Egyptian, Yemenite. Oh. Yeah. We're like from everywhere. Oh my God. What a blend. What a melange. Middle Eastern melting pot. Yeah. I love that. So, so you grew up pretty Jewish. And then when did you start like transitioning into this sort of like pr proudful Judaism and having that sense of, of pride that you have now? Yeah, I don't want to say it took me too long because it's better late than never. And it's not even that late in my life. But mm -hmm. <laughs> going, to back what I, going back to what I said before, being complacent means I was never proud, but I was never ashamed. Like it, it was always part of my identity, but I would never show it off per se. And I was your typical like Long Island Jew growing up. I went to private school for high school and my junior year of high school I went on, not March of the Living, but it was a tour of the concentration camps. And then following the tour, we went to Israel to like lighten up. But the concentration camps like messed me up mentally so bad. I didn't even enjoy mm -hmm. Israel. I was so mentally ill. I had fever. I couldn't stomach what I had just seen in Poland. And it, I couldn't possibly enjoy myself after that. But it's fine because it was crucial for me to see because subconsciously, it took me a long time to realize where my pride came from. And I can definitely accredit seeing what could have been and then seeing how we came through that and that just made me proud to have overcame such an atrocity like the holocaust and getting through something like that showed we can get through anything and that really made me proud of who i am but it wasn't a direct correlation mm. I, I went on with high school 
suddenly I started to build a platform. It started when I ran and lost for Miss New York, but that's when my platform started. And once I realized what I said can actually influence people, then I started to show off like who I am more because it's been important to me my whole life, but no one else knows that. Even yesterday, I got a DM from a girl. She's like, wow, I didn't know you were Jewish. I just read your story in the Algeminer. That's so cool. I agree with what you said, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you still don't know I'm Jewish? I have to do more. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like an <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, those, uh, first of all, the Poland Israel trips are so powerful. We also did one our junior year of high school. It's like, it will, ch I think it's so, it's just so eye opening to be on a trip, you know, especially when you're, you know, co gender trip. See, we're with, like all these guys you've never seen really cry before. And all of a sudden you're standing on like the, a freaking mass grave of children watching some of your closest guy friends just like break down into tears, watching all of your, like, and you're just thinking, you're just imagining like this could have been uh, like this could have been us this is our ancestors this is our people like and it's it's such a uh a wake it's just such a wake-up call like that you know we actually face so much and what these sort of like anti-semitic remarks can lead us to that it's not just you know upsetting it's not just offensive it doesn't just hurt our feelings it's it's killed our people in the millions before and not to, you know not to mention just obviously with the holocaust but also we we both come from very miserable areas the middle east north africa all of that like all of those people got the pogroms and the massacres and the ex expulsions i mean it's like it's really crazy to think about like everything that we've been through so i i do understand what you're saying in the in terms of like makes everything very real you know right and i really dislike when people say oh but that was then it's not now it can never happen again you guys run the world it's my favorite stereotype but that's not true because jews were equally as successful today as they were then we were in broadway we were actors we were filmmakers we were producers nothing changed it doesn't religion doesn't make you different than the rest of the world the mm -hmm. only was that the the world let that happen the only thing i hope had changed is the fact that we will never let that happen ever again i mean, I mean my brother just commented we've been discriminated many times before the holocaust listen i hope first of all people need to realize the holocaust was less than 100 years ago people including my younger sister if you're watching this shame on you she came to me yesterday she was like wow not yesterday but this week and she was like i didn't realize the holocaust was so like recent and I was like, yeah, what do you mean we have survivors left on this planet? Very few, but there are survivors left. And when people look at something like something you just read in a textbook and you learn about because you have to, that's not doing its due diligence. We need to actually understand and show people this is what happened. Here's why it was so bad. Hopefully that part's self-explanatory. And here's how we can never let that happen again. But not enough people care about the third step, how we can never let this happen again. And that really concerns me. Yeah. Back to the stereotypes, though, what you were saying is so important. Like, you know, the stereotypes that they've attributed to Jews are always the stereotypes that will work during that time to be able to attack us. Right. Yeah. So whether we're seen as weak or strong or powerful or this, it's whatever you can attribute to us that will make us a um, a threat, that will make us vermin, that will make us something that needs to be taken out, that needs, you know, a problem that has to be handled. And so it's like, you know, people can... Uh, you know, I get these questions all the time, like, why do you care about these stereotypes? They're so positive. And I, it's, it drives me bonkers because the thing is, it's like, you don't understand that these are not things that are used in a positive light. These are things to use to be able to have, you know, they're told to people so they see us as a threat, so they can come after us. Also, I love that your brother is in here right now. I thought when he mentioned he's your number one fan, I'm like, oh, do they just have the same last name? I don't know. <laughs> I agree. A lot of people say, a lot of people sometimes, and this is very interesting, and I'm not a sensitive person, just to preface what I'm saying. People will come to me and say, oh, it's because you're Jewish, you're so successful, so young, because they don't understand it's a backhanded compliment. Because if people turn to us, like with these stereotypes, like you run the world, that let's just run with that one. We run the world, mm -hmm. when things go south, that's our fault too. But guess what? That's what Hitler said, and clearly it had worked. So when people give us these, these, I, I guess you could call it like pressure of running the world and running the media and, and all that fun stuff, they can also use the same excuse when things go south. And the funniest part is, it's just not true. In fact, we make up 2% of the population. So how much of the world can we run? You know, <laughs> We can't even agree amongst each other to be able to, you know, you, you have to be able to agree to run the world. We can't even agree. If Jews agreed, you'd be very scary. But <laughs> no, in all seriousness, um, what was I saying? Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. Something about the media. The media. 
yeah everyone thinks the jews run the media but the truth is we are so our portrayal in the media is so negative that i don't really understand how people constantly use that one but that you know the thing with there's so many different anti-semitic tropes that are out there that are very frustrating because it's people don't understand like the way in which that's pre like you know for example for you crediting your success to judaism completely negates everything that you've done yourself i was not a successful 21 year old or 18 year old or whatever it was when you started reaching your levels like so I would, I'm Jewish. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's, it's, it completely negates like all the actual hard work that you put into everything. And it doesn't really, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just rude. It's like saying everything that anyone's ever gotten is because of, you know, I don't know, because they're pretty, because they're this, because they, you know, they're that. Like, it's, it completely ruins all of the other hard work and the effort that they have to put into all of the things that they do, which is just so insane to me. Like, people work hard for the things that they get. And a lot of people think that there's, I don't know. I, I get very frustrated with that one, especially the around the world and the, the they're all wealthy. You know how many Jews live below the poverty line? People never talk about that. You go to Brooklyn, it's not pretty. I'm not in Brooklyn, I'm in Long Island, but I've seen many Jews that are like, they're on food stamps. We're, we're not different because we choose to believe in this faith in God. That does not make us inhumane. It doesn't make us a different breed of humans. It simply just makes us choose to practice a certain religion. And people act like, it's us versus them. It's really not us versus them. Mm, absolutely. Okay, so talk to us. We only, uh, we're going to like try and keep this to really 30 minutes. So I really want to hear a lot about, um, first of all, just your career and stuff, because you have done so many impressive things. And then we can tie it back into Judaism towards the end. But give us just like, a, how did you, first of all, this whole Instagram live situation, I don't know if people know, especially the Jewish Journal audience, how impressive it was how you started off, you know, we're talking about all this hard work and everything. So talk to us about the beginning. Like, how did you get everything going? Give us the whole IG live story and how you started building this following. And I have no idea you're even in a pageant. That's so remarkable. Was that before Instagram live? That was, yeah, I was in high school still. It was like uh, brutal. Oh. I'm going to, I'm going to show off real quick. I have a bunch of tennis trophies here. I really don't like, hey. but I lost and it was like an awakening for me. So I'm going to go back. Um, I went to high school and I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I always understood communication was one of my biggest strengths because um, I had a nickname like, you know, I just always had a problem with talking to people, whether it be in class or whatever it is. I'm just very much a people person. And there was something I understood, but I never took like, I would say a hobby and tried to make it a career. Um, my mom's sister is a surgeon. My mom's a lawyer. She's an anesthesiologist. Um, and I always thought I would want to do one of those things because just having these role models in my life, you want to follow their footsteps. Um, also to say my mom and her sister are both very beautiful. And I was like, I want to be just like them. So lawyer or doctor, that's going to be the way to go. Typical Jew. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I get to college and I realize I don't really want to be in medical school until I'm 30. Um, it's just not something I want to do. And I should start looking in another direction. Now, my father and my grandfather and so many people around me always said, you're going to be on TV one day. I don't care if you agree or not. Joey, you didn't say anything. <laughs> I don't care if you agree or not. You are going to be on, you're going to be an anchor one day, news, entertainment, whatever it is, I see you being on TV. And I would just laugh like, okay, sure. But in my mind, it's like, where do you even possibly begin? It's so far fetched. I, that's what I thought at the time, being 18, 17, actually. Suddenly, I get to college hated med school. I was very good at science. I also took comms classes, writing classes, and I realized I like the communications way better than the medicine. Let me reconsider my stance on life. Pandemic hits and suddenly school was canceled for six weeks. It was gone. I didn't have school for a year almost. And then Zoom kicked in and I had so much time to reconsider what I wanted to do. So that was something that a, a horrible situation that ended up benefiting me. The pandemic, we had time off but I used that time to actually think about what I wanted to do. And I realized I really want to listen to all of these people and decide to go into TV. So now I was like, where the heck do I even begin? And you know, all, all the time in the pandemic until today, I'm on Twitter spaces. My mom's always hearing like this background noise because I'll tune into people's lives. And she's always like, why do you watch other people's lives but you don't go by yourself? And I was like, mom, no one cares to hear what I have to say. And she's like, you want to bet? And I was like, yeah. And I'll start going live and people cared what I had to say. <laughs> and it was, it was just an eye opener for me. I was like, oh my God, I could probably do this. I can make this bigger than just me speaking to like everyone who's bored at home during the pandemic. Like this is a really good time to get involved. And what I did was I went to so many 
basketball games in high school because New York, you have the Knicks and the Nets, and it was just so convenient for me. And I decided to ask a couple of players that I knew they knew who I was from posting and being present if they would be willing to join a live with me. And surprisingly, I got a lot of people to say yes. Now, when you go on live, as you can see, I see a lot of familiar faces in the comments. You know, you, co you we collaborate. I see your followers. Mm -hmm. What was nice is that I was trying to break into this TV world and I had the right audience joining my lives. So domino effect, I started interviewing athletes on live. An MTV producer who was a huge Knicks fan loved my Instagram lives and asked me if I could audition to host a season of their show. Now, I'm 18. I'm like, there's zero chance I make this audition. But what does it hurt me to like not make it? At least I tried. And I got it. Then the same producer leaves MTV, goes to another company, produces a fight, produces this, and they ask me to come along with them. So for me, that it was just like a momentum type thing where it's like I started with this, I got one opportunity, I did well at that opportunity and opened many doors for me. Now, fast forward, what is it, three years, it's like it became a career for me. And once I really got into this space, I understood people really have a misconception of what a Jew is. I'm a Jew. Do I rub you off as a weird, unique, different breed of a type of person? Absolutely mm. not. I hope not. Mm. But <laughs> and that's why I started to be more vocal. It's hard when you're in the media, isn't it? And you start to realize like, wow, there's this crazy perception of Jews. Because growing up, you know, as you were talking about earlier at the beginning of this conversation, it wasn't that you were not proud. You were complacent. You just you weren't ashamed. We weren't proud because you didn't really have like a reason to be either direction. Exactly. There wasn't really, you know, you were in kind of the Jewish bubble, you were surrounded by more, Jew like, you know, just a New York Jewish environment, there isn't as much of a reason. But as you start growing up, and you go into the limelight a little bit more, and you start getting the hate, or, you know, people talking to you, and you start meeting these new people who've never met a Jew before, and they say, wow, you're the first Jew I ever met, you're so normal, you're so kind, <laughs> and you're like, are you, are you serious? But it's true, right. it happens all the time. And you start to then feel that sense of pride take over, because you're like, oh, people have no idea. And you have this huge platform and you, you know, you want to use it in that way. So I think that's pretty awesome. What talked to me, celebrity fighting, that came from the same person who did the uh, MTV thing? So I remember I got a phone call one day. She's like, I don't even want to tell you this because you're so young. I don't believe they'll ever take you, which was like, <laughs> broke my heart right away. Because I don't act my age and I don't feel my age, but whatever. So she's like, I really don't want to tell you this, but I threw your name into a pile of contenders to host a huge celebrity boxing fight at the Hard Rock in Miami. Now, don't get your hopes up. I sent them what you've previously done. My fingers are crossed and I rooted for you. I didn't think much of it. And then I get an email, congratulations, you were selected. I thought it was spam. Then the second after the email, she calls me. She's like, you got it. I don't believe it. Why don't you believe it? But it was funny. And it was such a hit. I remember being so nervous, but it went so well that they called me back to do it again the next year without even asking anyone else if they wanted to do it. Oh my God. I love that. I think you're perfect for celebrity boxing and it's such a great way to break out into the fight world. Yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting. When I did it, it was actually the first year it had become a thing. I was like, why are these TikTokers fighting YouTubers? Like which one of them are fighters? None of them. But fun. Everybody's a fighter now. Literally everybody's a fighter now. <gasps> yeah. All right. So what's been the favorite, what's been your favorite project that you've worked on um, in terms of like your media? It could be even something smaller, something bigger, whatever it is. Like, what have you had the most fun doing? The most fun? That's a great question. I'm trying to look at my list of things that I've done. I have like a little... Do you have a list of accomplishments? This is a list of to-do... This is to-do list, but it's really outdated and I've actually done almost everything on this list by now. Oh, wow. My, oh. my to-do list is not done. That was fun. Which one? So I flew to Vegas with my parents for NBA Summer League. Mm. It's basically uh, two weeks in Las Vegas. We congregate as the entire NBA. All the teams come. But particularly all of the rookies that have just been drafted and the second years or anyone else that feels like coming and supporting the team. But it becomes like a social event and everyone comes. Like all-stars, legends, LeBron, like whoever it is, everyone comes. And I interviewed some really high prospects. I interviewed... Chet Holmgren, Josh Giddey, Scotty Pippen Jr., Sharif O'Neal, do his name ring a bell? Probably. And they were such good quality interviews. I had a camera, a microphone, a set. It was just amazing. It was so much fun. And it's funny because I'm the same age as these players that are just starting in the league. So I really feel like I'm having a, a, a true conversation, which makes the quality of the interview just look better. It's not like there's no tension. There's a sense of comfort. And, and I, I really try to ask fun questions so that 
the fans don't get bored. I don't want to ask questions everyone's heard 20 times. I want to ask what shampoo do you use if I feel like it, you know? Yeah, give us your hair care routine. <laughs> Sponsored by Olaplex. <laughs> no. Hilarious. For real. No, but I, I actually really understand what you're saying because I feel like sports media is so redundant. It's always the same questions. The press is are like, they're, you know, in fight, in the fighting world, like the post-fight interviews are always the same thing. It's like, who do you want to see next? Was that your strategy going in? Was da, da, da. And it's like just the same stuff, you know, like give us something fresh. So I feel like because you're coming in same age as them, you can relate to them on their level. Like that does give you an edge. And we were talking about this when we were on our, our Google meet call, um, like a couple weeks ago, how it, it, the fact that you're so young is really rare in broadcasting, which is not necessarily rare in entertainment, but it is rare in broadcasting. Do you feel pressure going into these spaces because you're so young or does nobody even notice? So I guess that's because I don't look my age that no one treats me younger. But my least favorite part of the night is when someone's like, oh, how old are you? Which is a weird question to still be asking someone. But again, I don't really care. And I, I don't care answering them. I, I'm afraid it's going to change their perception because it really shouldn't. I remember, I can't remember the opportunity. I had something happening. And then, then I wrote my age and they changed their minds. And it was so horrible because before they knew my age, they didn't care. And suddenly it had changed their opinion. Uh, I can't remember. It'll come to me. But yeah, that's uh, definitely something when walking into a room. Growing up, I, you know, heard a lot from my dad, who's like very good at speaking to people. He would always say like, it really doesn't matter who's in that room. You were invited to be in that room. So nobody there is better than you. And that really resonated with me because it's just so true. If I was invited there, there's a reason. Mm. No one there is better than you. Maybe you're hosting it. Like, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. What was it Aaliyah said? AJ, nothing but a number, which is so true. You know, if you have the skill and you have the talent, then you're meant to be there. I think a lot of people are, yeah. But as females, I, do you ever feel more pressure as a woman going into these spaces? Because I do feel like there is just this weird, like they just take you a little bit less seriously. There is like a, just a slightly more of a barrier to get through, especially in sports. Although perhaps maybe it gives you almost an advantage sometimes in the sports area as well. What do you feel like? Yeah. that has done for you i think there's a huge misconception in sports that women don't have the upper hand um in fact i've been in rooms where only women are broadcasting so it's more recent that's for sure but today that's not a concern anymore the only thing is social media if god forbid a woman says something on tv that people don't agree with like if i say you know what i really think michael jordan is the greatest of all time which is not controversial but let's say i say that and people disagree my comments will be absolutely insane uh, my favorite comments in particular, sarcastic, um, go back to the kitchen woman. Uh, they put like brooms on my comments, like soap, room. Like if you say something that God forbid people don't like, you can expect your comment section to look like a zoo. But if Wait, a man- brooms? Because like, you're like to clean? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking like maybe like witch. I don't know. Why did I think witch no. instantly when I heard broom? <laughs> That's something women do deal with if you mess up it's it's heavier than if a guy messes up but i think the opportunity is the same the feedback is different mm. it can be hard taking in comments i guess that also ties back into what we we're talking about just with you know with being jewish in the media it's like you're the comments are weird do you how do you deal with that how do you deal with the hate that comes your way both i guess as being a woman and also being jewish in the media because it, it can get kind of abrasive especially with the following you have i can't even imagine the sort of stuff that's in your request inbox oh my god <laughs> uh this morning in particular i woke up and the unhealthy habit of checking my instagram first thing in the morning i refreshed on my feed and i had the same person comment through all hundred something of my posts spamming free palestine and then took a break i guess he got banned and then continued to spam me and i just thought it was funny like why are you wasting your time on my posts mm. um and, but 99 percent of the time i've never let comments bother me because I live my life very true to myself. If I say something, obviously people make mistakes and you can be insensitive sometimes, but I, I most of the time say things that it's coming from my heart and I live just very true to myself. So there's no reason why I'll do something and then regret it. Or like, I know I take every shot I can and I, I don't live with a lot of regrets in the industry per se. So knowing that no one could tell me something that hurts, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't agree with what you said. Okay, that's too bad. I don't agree with what you said. You want to agree to disagree. I just live a very let live life. And one time I remember actually getting 
very upset. I didn't want to get out of bed that morning. When Kyrie came out and made some anti, I don't want to say anti-Semitic remarks, insensitive remarks towards the Jewish community, before he had apologized, I wrote a letter to him on Twitter, knowing very well he could see it. And in response to my very nice letter, I was branded as a racist. Now that's different because that's not true to me. I'm not a racist person. I'm not racist at all. But now I have a thousand people calling me racist because I'm calling out a black man for posting something insensitive. Now that bothered me because that wasn't true. And I didn't know how to deal with it. Now everyone that knows me knows it's not true. But let's say you don't and you're looking at my Twitter at that particular moment and you see all my comments are, you're racist with mm. no contact. You don't understand it. It's from that letter where I'm politely asking Curry to apologize. And that really bothered me because there was no way to win that battle. And I just had to let time pass and things blow over. But that time passing was like rough. Yeah, it's harder when you are, when it's things that are just inaccurate, you know, when people are starting to go after you for something that you really know is not true. And it's something that's so like deeply against who you are as a person. Right. And especially when, you know, when you're standing up to anti-Semitism and you're standing up to things that you feel like are offensive for your people. And then someone's like, oh, well, you're actually being racist by standing up for your people. It's like, that's just you know how can you turn way to turn it around on me and i think that jews experience that a lot they were also saying oh i hate that you only stand up for anti-semitism like that shows you don't care about other communities that's not true because i've stood up for probably every community that was being harassed during george floyd i would actually i still have it because i just i'm a hoarder i have my i stand with george floyd poster that i put all over my windows i protested i made videos i was on social media but it's like so you just simply chose not to see that? Or God forbid, when the Asian community was being harassed, specifically in New York, stop Asian hate. I was there for that. I'm not Asian. I'm not Black. But it's important to be a backbone for one another. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what I'm talking about, building bridges. It's not only about me. It's not only about you. So when people say, like, oh, you're selfish for just talking about anti-Semitism, no, you're selfish for not. Yeah. <laughs> I stand yeah. up for not standing up for me. Yeah, Absolutely. And also, I mean, it's like, you know, when you're, when there's such a massive rise in anti-Semitism, which is what's happening right now, are we supposed to just remain silent? Like, are we supposed to remain silent? You know what I mean? Like, what is, what is, what are people looking for? It just makes no sense. Are we supposed to, all lives matter, our cause, which is what a lot of people have been doing. Like, we, we get a lot of uh, letters denouncing anti-Semitism, but in the same letters, they'll denounce every other type of bigotry. But if you ever did that when there was a rise in any sort of other hatred in any other group, people would be very upset with that. They'd be like, why are you all this mattering this cause? Sorry, my dog is going nuts. He, he all, my dog is also very anti-anti-Semitism. <laughs> He's fighting against it too. But it's, it's true and it's really, it upsets me so much that we have to face that kind of um, double standard. But I think just being Jews in general, we're always facing these massive double standards across right. the board. And as American Jews too, you know, we're asked to answer for like, it, like people that ask us to comment on Israel all the time, which listen, like I'm a very proud per Jew that's lived in Israel for six years. I love Israel as a whole, as a country, everything, but I'm, I'm also very critical of the place, you know, and I'm, I'm not afraid to criticize things that I think that are wrong. And if anybody knew Israelis in Israel, they would know that they're also very critical people. <laughs> and so, but, but most American Jews are, you know, they're American first. They, they live in America. That's their national politics. And so for them to have to answer about Israeli politics when they're entering these progressive spaces and universities here, it's really a ridiculous double standard that you would never ask anybody else to do. No Iranian American is being asked to answer for Iranian politics when they go into, you know, a Me Too meeting at Berkeley or whatever. But yet somehow Jewish kids are being asked to answer for Israeli politics when they go into um, any of these meetings inside of their college campuses. It's just it's like really a ridiculous double standard that we face all the time. And it's it's frustrating. Um, but I'm I'm really glad that in terms of just the online hate and stuff, you're able to not internalize it because I think that's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do especially when it, it comes like on mass yeah for sure um Thank you. okay so we're at the 33 minute mark I want to like wrap up just to keep respect your time and it's obviously Friday Shabbat Shalom to everybody that's here listening to us uh, so give us your final thoughts, your final words. And we also, by the way, we'll be releasing some articles on Emily. So please tune into the JewishJournal.com to read those. Hopefully we'll do more of these too, because Emily's awesome and now she's my client. So I have to put her to work. Um, and yeah, so Emily, just send us off with something. Like, what are your final words to our audience here? Maybe a piece of advice for younger Jews that are listening to this um, and that are sort of going through the thick of it like we are right now. Yes. So, you know, 
at first I thought I'd be speaking to predominantly Jews, but I forgot my followers are like really diverse, which makes me so happy. And I see there's a range of different people from different backgrounds here. So I, I just want to say, I think it's really important that no matter what religion you practice, no matter what color your skin is, no matter what you believe in at all, I think it's really important to reach out to one another and have these conversations and just engage in dialogue because if you actually bother to speak with one another, you'll understand we're not that much different. And just find that common denominator and build a bridge instead of building up this wall because you think that we're so different. So you put up your guard. No, put your, put your guard down and talk to one another. And that's it. That's the, the secret formula. Just talk to one another. And then you'll see how much you actually like each other despite these minor differences. And, you know, especially something like Judaism. It's, we're, we're believing in a God. You believe, hopefully you believe in a God. And we should never judge each other based off of that. Absolutely. I love that. Great final words. Also, wait, you do Twitter spaces. Do you do them a lot, though? I do Twitter spaces. I love talking about sports in particular, but sometimes, like, I join Iranian Twitter spaces just to show them, like, hey, I'm here for you guys. Keep fighting. I'm trying to help you out here in the US. Shabbat shalom, Russell. Okay, amazing. Let's do Twitter space. I love Twitter spaces. I used to do Clubhouse all the time. I was like, that was my quarantine live stream situation. <laughs> Everyone for joining. I, I was trying to read some of the comments. I'm a little bit blind, but. I saw a lot of hearts and stuff, so thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining, guys. And this is going to be posted to our feed on the Jewish Journal Instagram, as well as on the Jewish Journal YouTube channel. This is JJ Live. We're going to be interviewing remarkable Jews, doing remarkable things in this wonderful space and in their own industries, respectively. So please tune in. I'm Shani Suisa. This is Emily Awesome, Emily Austin, who is awesome. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. <laughs> thank you guys next time.